And we've talked a lot about acids and bases, but now uh, I mentioned water. And water has the ability to be what's called amphoteric, which means it has the ability to be an acid or a base, depending upon the situation and what's next to it, what it's interacting with. Um, I want to talk about something else, though, associated with water. And it's called autoionization of water. Um, if you think about it, it'll make sense as to what this means. If you had to pick two ions that, that water was made of, what two ions would you pick? Okay, hydrogen and I said ions, not just elements. What ions would make up water? Hydrogen is one. What are you left with? What does a hydrogen ion look like? What's the charge? Okay, so you got H plus 1. What do you got left in a water molecule? And another hydrogen. What ion does that make? Ah, hydroxide. Good. So if you have a hydrogen and a hydroxide together, you have a water molecule. So when I'm talking about autoionization, what you have is water molecules that actually autoionize themselves. In other words, they can separate out and form hydrogen and hydroxide ions in solution. Okay. Now this happens um, only just a tiny, tiny bit. If this, you know, it, we a solution of water, or I guess just even if it was pure liquid water, liquid water is technically, in, in chemical uh, from a chemical perspective, a very, very, very weak, extremely dilute solution of hydrogen ions and hydroxide ions, because most of the molecules you're looking at are actually bound together as H2O molecules. However, every once in a while, a very, very extremely small amount of them are auto-ionized, and they separate out into ions. And then they usually join right back and form molecules again, and it's just over and over. Okay? And there's just a few of them at any given time that are auto-ionized. Um, so water can be an extremely weak, pure water can be an extremely weak electrolyte, but it is very bad electrolyte. The only reason that it has, it has any electrolytic properties at all is because some of those water molecules actually have ionized at, at any given time. Um, <clears throat> all right, so about one out of every 10 million water molecules are going to go through this process known as autoionization at any given instant in a, in a sample of water. Okay? And there's what, there's what I mean by autoionization. Now, it is reversible. That means when they form, they can easily just reform back into what they were. Um, another way to look at this is because what actually happens is you don't get, this thing doesn't just fall apart, okay? Because water we know is not held together by an ionic bond. Water is held together by covalent bonds. So as easy as it is to want to look at this and see how there is a hydrogen and a hydroxide that could come together to make this, which is what happens when you mix an acid and a base together, but realize that this, since this is not an ionic compound, what technically happens is you get two water molecules next to each other. And when two water molecules come next to each other, one of them acts like an acid, one of them acts like a base. One of them will pick up a hydrogen from this one, like this one, will grab this hydrogen and make a hydronium ion, which is the same thing as having a hydrogen ion, because it's just a water with an extra hydrogen. And the other one will be stripped of its hydrogen, left with a hydroxide ion. So this is what it seems to be chemically, but what actually is happening is, is what, what's written in the second equation down here. Okay. So that means that all aqueous solutions, anything that's dissolved in water, will always have at least a tiny bit of hydrogen and hydroxide ions in that solution, right? If you take a sodium chloride solution, <coughs> excuse me, and drop it in, 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 or I mean, solid sodium chloride, tiny little pinch, dissolve it in water, you've got a sodium chloride solution. What all ions are present? Well, sodium ions, chloride ions, and water molecules. Also, though, because one in every 10 million water molecules react with themselves, you're also going to have hydrogen and hydroxide ions floating around inside this water. But it's going to be very, very small, very weak, to the point where we don't even measure it. We just neglect it most of the time. But if we were to look at something, there, there's a number here that's very important. If we were to take an example, a sample of pure water, and we could measure it, and it was at 25 degrees Celsius, about 1 ATM, what we're feeling about right now, if we looked at it, we would find that in a pure sample of water, since they react one-to-one, -one, for every fl free-floating hydrogen, 
or hydronium ion, there tends to be a free-floating, one equivalent free-floating hydroxide ion. So it's sort of a one-to-one -one dissociation. What we're saying and what, we can, what we've monitored to be true is that the concentration of the hydrogens present and is equal to, obviously, then the concentrations of any of these hydroxides present. That's assuming you don't have another solution. Like if you have a sodium hydroxide solution, this is not true, right? Because there's a whole lot more hydroxide ions in there now. I'm talking about just pure water. In a sample of pure water, this concentration is equal to this concentration of the stuff floating around. And that actually has a numerical value that remains constant. It's 1 times 10 to the minus 7 molars. 1 times 10 to the minus 7 moles per liter. So that means in a sample of pure water, on average, if you had to ca calculate the concentration of hydrogen ions floating around in pure water, it would be 1 times 10 to the minus 7 moles per liter. So very, very small. Likewise, hydroxide would be exactly equivalent to that in pure water because they come from each other. They, they, they come from the same process. So whatever process produced this had to be the same process that produced that. So they should be one to one. All right. Now, why is this important? Well, let me ask you a question. You've heard of the pH scale before, right, from like other science classes or just life in general. What do you know about the pH scale? How high does it go? What number does it max out at? 14. What is considered the middle, the neutral point? See that? 1 times 10 to the minus 7. I'll explain these exponents in a minute. But they're all going to be related to the pH scale. I'll show you why. Okay, so this brings us to what's called the ion product constant of water. It's a fancy way of being able to multiply, going back one slide, these two concentrations together. If, I multi if this is 1 times 10 to the minus 7, and this is 1 times 10 to the minus 7, what's the product of that? You multiply those two together, what do you get? 1 times 10 to the what? Minus 14, right? 1 times 10 to the minus 14. How high does the pH scale go? 14. Okay. So the ion product of water is just that. Taken in a perfect sample like that, if you multiply the concentrations together, you're going to get a certain product. But we're going to take that a step farther and say that in pure water, each one is 1 times 10 to the minus 7. Hydrogen, hydroxide. Mult multiply it together, you get 1 times 10 to the minus 14. And what we're going to say even further is that that 1 times 10 to the minus 14 never changes. That is always the ion product constant for water. Now, if your hydroxide levels increase, that means your hydrogen levels decrease. So that whenever they're multiplied together, you still get 1 times 10 to the minus 14. Okay? That's what we call KW. It stands for the ion product constant of water, and it will always be 1 times 10 to the minus 14, okay? Now, in a pure sample, it's going to be split evenly. Half of it's going to be 1 times 10 to the minus 7. The other half is going to be 1 times 10 to the minus 7, hydrogen and hydroxide. In an acid sample, guess, what, guess which one of those concentrations are going to be higher? Hydrogen or hydroxide? Hydrogen. hydrogen. Okay, so you'll see that, that the 1 times 10 to the minus 7 will get to be a bigger number, right? When you have a minus 7, how does your exponent change when the number gets bigger? Does the actual number, 7, go to a lower number or a higher number whenever you are in that situation? For example, okay, yeah, let me, re let me rephrase the question. Let me ask it a different way. Which number is bigger, 1 times 10 to the minus 7 or 1 times 10 to the minus 6? Which one's a bigger number? Minus 6 is a bigger number, right? The pH scale. The lower the number, is it more acidic or more basic? Remember? The lower the number on the pH scale, like down to 3, 2, 1, that's very acidic, right? Because of these exponents. Okay? The lower the actual value, the, what the pH scale represents are those exponents taking away the negative sign. Okay? So if you take away the negative sign, it makes sense that the 6 is greater than the 7, right? And the 5 is greater than the 6. Okay? That's, that's the way the pH scale works, and that's why it seems to work backwards. I'll show you more here in a second. But for right now, KW is equal to 1 times 10 to the minus 14. All right? That will remain constant. That is just what this represents is any the, the product of any hydrogen and any hydroxide that comes from water alone, just from the autoionization of water. That doesn't count anything else you've brought in. This is just for water. That means if you're going to multiply these two things together and always get the same number, if this gets bigger, 
this has to get smaller. Otherwise, you won't be able to keep the same number and vice versa. If this gets bigger, that would have to get smaller in order, in order for you to maintain the same answer when you multiply them together. Okay? So that's, that's what we're looking at here. That means these are inversely proportional. That means when one goes up, the other one has to go down. Okay? All right. So in, now we're going to look at uh, acidic and basic solutions in terms of number measurement. If you have a neutral solution, meaning what that means is you have an equivalent amount of hydrogen and hydroxide ions. They're balancing each other out. That's a neutral solution. So that means each one of those concentrations have to be 1 times 10 to the minus 7, right? Because when you multiply them together, you've got to keep 1 times 10 to the minus 14. If you're going to have a neutral solution, this is going to be the concentration of your hydrogen and hydroxide due to water. Okay. Remember, neutral on the pH scale is 7, right? So there's why. So this is the reference to that. Okay. In an acidic solution, you would expect to have a higher amount of hydrogen present. That makes sense. So what would happen is this number, if you are looking at it and measuring it, would be something greater than 1 times 10 to the minus 7. So by default, what must be true is that whatever hydroxide is present must be less than 1 times 10 to the minus 7, right? Okay, in a basic solution, the opposite would be true. The hydrogen is going to be less than 1 times 10 to the minus 7. The hydroxide is going to have to be greater than that since it's a basic solution. That means hydroxide ions are present in greater amount. Okay, so this looks complicated, but it's, it's not. Okay, because all you've got to realize is that whenever you multiply these together, you have to keep your KW, your ion product for, for water. It's got to be 1 times 10 to the minus 14. All right, so the question says determine the hydrogen concentration, hydrogen ion concentration, for a 0 .00020 molar barium hydroxide solution and determine whether the solution is acidic, basic, or neutral. Now, you can look at the fact that it's barium hydroxide and say, well, it's a hydroxide. It's got to be basic. Um, and if I would have had H2SO4, it would have been sulfuric acid. You could have said, well, that's acidic. But now I want quantitative data showing me why or how. That means you've got to show me numbers that prove that it's acidic or basic, not just general theory, because the general theory is based upon these numbers. So you've got to show me the numbers now. All right, if you have barium hydroxide and you put it in something and it falls apart, realize that this is what's happening, right? You've got a barium ion. And there's two hydroxide ions present that will separate out and go into with your water. Now, what you've got to realize is that already, before you put this barium hydroxide in, there was, some, th there was water present. There was a certain amount of hydrogen and a certain amount of hydroxide just due to the water. We're going to assume that it was neutral water when you started, and it's going to be 1 times 10 to the minus 7 of each of those. So when you put in the barium hydroxide, which one of those two levels are you affecting? Are you affecting the, the hydrogen levels or are you affecting the hydroxide levels? This is an easy, easy answer, right? You're obviously affecting the hydroxide levels. You're putting more of it in there. So you're tipping that balance, right? All right. So what we've got to do is keep track of how much hydroxide we're putting in. Here we're putting in, we've got one mole of barium hydroxide would give us one mole of barium ions, two moles of hydroxide ions when this falls apart, okay? Therefore... To get my concentration of hydroxide, remember what I said, we've already talked about this. If I have this concentration of this solution, we're going to have the same, since this is a, one of these and two of those, I've got to double that, right? Double that concentration to tell me how many hydroxide, actual concentration of hydroxide ions I have. So that's why this two is right here. I'm going to double this concentration because this all fell apart. And in terms of hydroxide, there's my answer, right? 0 0.00040 molar. In other words, 4 times 10 to the minus 4 molar. That's my concentration of, of hydroxide ions that, I, that I've got in there now. All right, here's what I know to be true. I asked for the hydrogen ion concentration. Even though I gave you the formula of the compound in question is a hydroxide ions. How are you going to get the hydrogen ions that formed in the water from the fact that you just added hydroxide ions. How does all that work? Well, it's this. Just remember that Kw has to equal not only 1 times 10 to the minus 14, but what it represents is whatever that H is times the hydroxide, those concentrations. So that means 
that if I'm solving for this, I know this, and I know this. I just got to rearrange my variables. Okay? So what is the hydrogen concentration? It is whatever Kw is divided by the hydroxide when I pull that over here. So I've got 1 times 10 to the minus 14. I've got 4 times 10 to the minus 4 for my concentration there, and it's just a simple division problem. My answer is 2.5 times 10 to the minus 11. Let's compare. Why is this a basic solution? Okay. Uh, it says whether it's acidic, basic, or neutral. I'm telling you that it's, it's basic. Now, you, you follow my reasoning as to why. Look at the concentration of hydroxide ions. You see that? It's 4 times 10 to the minus 4. Is that more or less than, than 1 times 10 to the minus 7? What you want to look at is not this number, but the exponent. Which is bigger, a minus 4 or a minus 7? Minus 4. So this is bigger, right? What this means is you have more hydroxides present than what you would have in a neutral solution. Okay? Now let's look down here at the hydrogen. Minus 11. Is that more or less than what you would have in a neutral solution? Much less, right? So if you have more hydroxides than what you would have in a neutral solution, less hydrogens, in which case? I don't understand your question. Okay. Yeah. You said that uh, water will only absorb ten times the amount of hydrogen. That's right. How can that be? Well, first of all, what what we've got to conceptually understand is that these hydroxide ions are not they weren't they're above and beyond what the water had by itself. You're introducing hydroxide ions from an external source. Now if we were looking at water itself, the autoionization of water, any hydrogen and any hydroxide, the product of those, if those ions came directly from the water molecules present, then they have to always be equal. They have to always equal that, that times 10 to the minus 14. I don't know if that answers your question, but I, I, I guess I don't. trying to think through. You, you've added, well, I guess the bottom line is, I mean, the bottom line is you've, you've added to that proportion. Um, if, you, if you could still keep track of the amount of hydroxides and the amount of hydrogens that were in proportion to one another from the water alone, you would retain that proportion. But the problem is you have tipped that balance. You've brought in hydroxide ions from an external source that is no way you're not going to be able to preserve that proportion. I guess not. I mean, like the external stuff is what becomes the equation. I don't. I don't. You said the auto ionization. Right. Because you have one hydrogen and one hydrogen. Yeah. Of water alone. Right. So this is. So does it have to do with. No, this is not water alone. These hydroxides come in from, from barium hydroxide molecules that aren't water anymore. Yes. Right. Right. Okay. Well, th okay. I see what you're saying. Now. But yeah, you're right because we we are this is not water alone anymore. This is water plus an external bringing in of hydroxide ions. So, just know how to do this. So don't worry about Um All right. Determine the hydrogen concentration uh, and whether the solution is acidic, basic, or neutral for the following. So let's make sure we know how to do this. So if we have a hydroxide ion concentration, this is easy because there's, there's no, you don't have to figure out what dissociates or anything like that like you do down here. So I'm telling you that the hydroxide ion concentration is 0 0.000250 molar. How do I go about calculating the concentration of hydrogen? Okay. Well, I know that Kw is always the same, and I know that hydroxide times hydrogen concentrations 
is equal to that kW, which is 1 times 10 to the minus 14. So then I write down what I know. I know this, and I know kW, and I just rearrange and I solve for, for h. Okay? Same thing down here. Now, in this case, if, if you write these things out, you can tell by looking already whether it's acidic or basic. Like if you would have wrote that in scientific notation, you would have had 2.5 times 10 to the minus 1, 2, 3, 4. Okay? And we know like 1 times 10 to the minus 7 is our neutral point. So if, like, if, like if we look at this one, 10 to the minus 8, is that less than or more than a normal neutral solution? Less than. So we've got lower amounts of hydroxide than a neutral solution. That must mean we're going to have higher amounts of, of hydrogen, right? So if you have a higher amount of hydrogen than normal, less amount of hydroxide than normal, what do you got, acid or a basic solution? Is that solution acidic or basic? You've got less than normal hydroxides, less than normal. Remember, hydroxide makes the base. You've got less than normal hydroxide. That must mean you're going to have to have higher than normal hydrogen. So if you've got more hydrogen than you do hydroxides, do you have an acid or a base? You've got an acid. Okay, this is an acidic solution. All right. So if we know this, here is our hydrogen ion. We're solving for this. We know that Kw divided by the hydroxide is going to give us our answer. So here's our hydroxide concentration. There's Kw. Work it out. You've got 4 times 10 to the minus 11. That's obviously much, much less than the amount of hydroxide that you had. So that means you've got a lot more hydroxide present. That means you've got a base. Okay? Even if it's a very weak, it doesn't matter. It's a basic solution. That means if you test the pH, it'll show up as a base. Okay? A basic solution. Do this one. Do the same thing. We solve for hydrogen. Take 1 times 10 to the minus 14 divided by 3.5 times 10 to the minus 8. Then you get 2.86 times 10 to the minus 7. Now, that minus 7 is deceiving because the exponent now looks neutral. So now we've got to look at the actual number. Remember, 1 was what we were looking for. So now it's a matter of, um, you know, is this going to be higher? Is 2.86 times 10 to the minus 7 higher of greater value than 1 times 10 to the minus 7? And the answer is, of course, yes. Right? Um, or we can just look. Either way you want to look at it, let's compare our acid level to our base level. 2.86 times 10 to the minus 7, 3.5 times 10 to the minus 8. Which one of those is bigger? This one, right? So that means you have more hydrogens present than you do hydroxides. Therefore, if you test the solution, it will test moderately acidic. If you test its pH, okay? All right. <clears throat> Take a look at calcium hydroxide. Now, there's an extra step involved with this because I don't give you just hydroxide ion concentration. I give you the total concentration for calcium hydroxide. So what you've got to do is do what to the concentration? You've got to double it because there's two hydroxides that will come out for every one of these that dissociate. So we take that 2 times 0 0.20 to get 0 0.40 molar. Then we do the same thing we just did. Okay? If that's the case, we divide, we get 2.5 times 10 to the minus 14. How does that compare to our hydroxide ion concentration? Obviously, it's much, much less, right? That's an actual 0.4. This is 2.5 times 10 to the minus 14, a bunch of zeros, way over here. That's a really small number compared to that. So that means there's a whole lot more hydroxide ions around than there is hydrogen ions. Therefore, it's going to be basic. Okay. Follow that? We'll see. Okay, now, the pH scale. When we look at the... Uh, I'm going to bring in that in a second, but if we look now, pretend like this was a pH scale. I'll show you where those numbers come in a second, but here's 10 to the minus 7. Remember we said that here's our hydroxide ion, or sorry, our hydrogen ion concentration. Here's our hydroxide ion concentration down here, and we said that at neutral, that means about where there's the same amount of hydrogen and hydroxide present, there's 1 times 10 to the minus 7 moles per liter of each, right? You multiply them together, you get 1 times 10 to the minus 14. Okay, what, to visualize what's happening here, we know that as the hydrogen decreases, right, in order to, to, to keep the same value, you've got to proportionally increase the amount of hydroxides. And the same goes true in the other direction. As this number, remember this is increasing, going from a minus 7 to a minus 5 to a minus 3, that's actually getting bigger in terms of its value. It's just that it's very small because the amount of these things dissolved in water are very, very small, right? 
So as this continues to increase in concentration, the hydroxide will likewise decrease in concentration. And you will find the same thing um, at this point, at this, pivot, this pivotal point where everything is sort of neutral, there's the same amount of both present. Once you start to tip those scales, that's where you get acid base. Notice that where, as soon as the hydroxide ion concentrations start to get larger than the hydrogen, you get solutions that are basic in nature. And likewise, in the other direction, when things start to tip the scale and become more hydrogens present than hydroxide, you start getting acidic solutions. Naturally, things that are way down here are pretty very strong acidic solutions versus the things that are way over here. Okay. Now it says, even though it may look like it, neither hydrogen, or sorry, neither hydrogen ions or uh, not, uh, or hydroxide ions will ever be zero because ten to the zero is one, right? Um, it's you're not going to get because of the dissociation of water. You know that's that's not going to happen. Now you can have greater than one molar concentrations for other things, okay, that are out there like you know sulfuric acid, twelve molar nitric acid, you know. I mean, 18 molar hydrochloric acid, 12 molar. These are very, very concentrated acids. Um, one molar is the theoretical end here of what we're talking about because we're talking about water, and we're talking about the hydrogen and hydroxides that come apart in water. So that's very, very weak compared to all the other stuff. That's why we, our scales cut off here. Okay. All right. Now, the pH scale is actually a logarithmic scale, and what you see here is a logarithmic scale. What do I mean by that? I mean, if these steps are not just one value at a time. Now, think about it. If I go from, well, if I go from 1 times 10 to the minus 2, how do I write that in decimal form? Okay, 0 0.01. And then I look at uh, 1 times 10 to the minus 3. How do I write that? 0, 0, 1. Now, is that, what factor of an increase is that? When I go from, if I move up from 1 times 10 to the minus 3, which is this, and I move up to 1 times 10 to the minus 2, which is this, if, if I took this divided by this, what would my answer be? How many places did I go? What does each decimal place represent in our scale? A tenth, right? So a, a factor of 10. Each step on this scale from 1 to minus 2 to minus 3 to minus 4 is not just one number step. It's actually a factor of 10. So if something, if you measure something that the pH is 7 and something else that the pH is 6, it's only one number, but it's a huge difference. It's 10 times the difference in concentration. Okay? So if something has a pH of 4 and a pH of 3, whatever the pH of 3 is is actually 10 times stronger than a thing that's pH of 4. pH of 2 would be how many times stronger than a pH of 4? See, that's the thing. Every step is a factor of 10. That means you multiply by 10 every step, right? So it would be 100 times. So it doesn't seem like a big difference between 2 and 4 because if you subtract them, you get the number 2. What does that mean? It's a logarithmic scale. There's huge jumps here. From 2 to 4 is actually a 100-fold increase. And then from 5 to 2 would be a 1,000-fold di difference in terms of the concentration. One, a pH of 2 is a 1,000 times more acidic than something that's a pH of 5. So decibel numbers, you know, 2.2 versus 2.1 in pH, it's a big difference okay, in terms of concentration. So we're, we're, looking, we're looking for narrow, narrow ranges here. All right, so we use pH a lot of times, especially in the biological world and the programs that you'll be in. Like if you're MLT, you test for the pH of whether it's urine, whether it's blood, whatever. Um, you know, if you're in respiratory, this is a big deal. I mean, you know, respiratory pH, you know, acid levels, that kind of stuff. It doesn't matter. This is a biologically very important situation. Um, how, uh, what does pH mean? Now, we, we looked at uh, how it's sort of calculated now, the numbers and the theory behind that is the, the little the negative sign and the concentrations and how much hydrogen and hydroxide is present. But what does the P stand for in pH? Anybody know? In case you're on Jeopardy, you need to know. Ah, good guess. We know what the H stands for, right? What does H stand for? Hydrogen. Okay, that's an easy one. P is not so obvious, that's why I asked. I like how you just pull out chemical words, though. Anything else begins with P that was talked about? Uh, 
percentage. Oh, that's a good one. That would be a good guess. Percent hydrogen, percentage hydrogen. Um, but that means our answer would have to be in a percent. So that's probably not it. It's probably not something you think of. It's called potential. Potential hydrogen. It, it, it tells you in a solution how much potential it has to, to donate hydrogen ions to a situation. Okay? All right. How do you calculate pH? You're going to have to know how to do this. Okay? It's simple. This is where you're going to have to have your calculator. I'm going to show you how to do this. So if you have your calculator, get it out now, please. If you don't, then pay attention very carefully so that when it comes time for you to do this, you can hopefully remember how. Okay? Here is the equation that we're going to use. It's pretty straightforward. You'll hit one button on your calculator, and it should take care of it for you. But we'll look and see. It depends on your calculator, but we'll look. pH, to calculate the pH, what you want to do is turn this concentration value that you have into a whole number, or not a whole number, but into a regular number, not like times 10 to the minus something. You just want to give me a number between 0 and 14. That's what you're looking for. So basically, you know, this is going to be easy. If you know, for example, that your concentration is 1 times 10 to the minus 2, if it was that perfect and the world worked like that, and your number that you got was 1 times 10 to the minus 2, guess what the pH is? 2. It's on the exponent. Okay? Um, it's tricky. That's okay. I'm, I'm going to trick you here in a second. Um, the <laughs> um, 1 times 10 to the minus 2 is pH of 2. Guess what uh, 1 times 10 to the minus 4 is? pH of 4. 1 times 10 to the minus 14. What about 2.67 times 10 to the minus third, minus 3? Not so easy. You can't just use the exponent anymore. Okay? You, you've got you've to, uh, if it was 1 in front of it, 1 times 10 to the whatever, then we just use the exponent. But since it's not, we have something like that, which is what real life is. We never test anything with a perfect number. Right? Um, we have to be able to mathematically convert like that. Okay, and we do that by this equation. Our pH will be the negative log. In other words, you're, you're, turning, you're turning your decimal number into that logarithmic big step like I was talking about. The negative log of the hydrogen ion concentration. So here's what you do. If you take, for example, let's do this one. Um, say your pH was, uh, uh, blah, 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 was 1. Okay. Oh, no, um, we're calculating pH. Let's say our concentration of hydrogen was... 0.1 molar, okay? So if, if our concentration of hydrogen was 0.1 molar, and I ask, what is the pH of a 0.1 molar solution? How would you find that out? What you would do is type in, it depends on the order, okay? This is one way you would do it. It depends on your calculator. On my calculator, I would type in 0.1 because that's the concentration of my hydrogen. Then I would hit the log button. It should say L-O-G, right? What did you get for those of you who that worked for? You got a minus 1. Notice that in front of the log, there's a negative sign, right? Guess what that negative sign means? That means you take the negative of a negative, which is what? Positive. So if you have a solution that is concentrated at 0.1 molar, what's its pH? 1. Right? That's how you do it. So you not, depending on your calculator, you may have to type in first the log button and then followed by the number. It just depends. Yeah, you can, but this is fewer buttons. You get confused. You can just get rid of the, the negative sign if you want to in your head. You can type it in. Work. <coughs> okay? Yes. Less, less buttons. See this? Uh, where's your log button here? Right here. So you would take, looks like you hit log first. Log, and then it'll say parentheses. So we typed in point one, and then hit enter. It's a negative one. But you want the negative of that, right? Because it says negative log. So you could just hit, I mean, you could do it in your head, or you could just hit your positive negative button, which is wherever that is, right here. And then, oops, no. You know what I mean. You just inverse the negative. All right? Easy enough, right? If you have, whatever your concentration is, whatever your concentration is, you should be able to type it in your calculator. Don't, if you don't bring your calculator with you, good luck hand doing a, a logarithmic calculation okay um, <coughs> no I'm not going to show you how to do that um, the negative log of the hydrogen ion concentration gives you pH all right now we can inverse that if I ask you um, 0.1 I, if I, no, sorry if I said the pH was 0.1 turn that into a concentration 
how, what concentration would that represent if I had a pH of 1? Well, what you would do is realize that, by definition, you don't have to know this, but what a logarithm, the log of something is what 10 would have to be raised to, what power 10 would have to be raised to to get your answer. Okay, that's what a logarithm is. So, for example, if I know the pH and I want to know the concentration, what I would do is if you find your log button, you should see right above it or next to it a button that has a number 10 raised to an exponent, like, like x or 10 to the x or whatever. It's, it should be connected with your log button. Okay? What you would type in is the negative value of the pH. So in this case, we said it, what did I say, 1? So type in negative 1 and then hit that 10 to the x button. You may have to do a second mode or something like that to get to it. And you should get 0.1 as your answer. Did you? No, not E. E is a natural log. That's natural log. I want this one right here. Let's see. Negative one. Let's see. So it depends on the order. You may have to do it in a different order. Point one should be the answer. That's right. So you get it? Yep. 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 So you're gonna you're gonna want to take the inverse of the log, which is ten to the whatever, ten to the x. Usually, it's like a second function of the log button. You should see it connected to it. You would type in your pH. Either you would either type in your pH first with the negative sign and then hit that button, or else you would hit that button first then type your number in the pH number in. It depends on your calculator. If you have trouble, ask somebody or ask me, but you're gonna you don't want to miss points for not knowing how to use the calculator. Okay, that's 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 crazy. If you're gonna miss points, at least make it a good way to miss points. Okay. All right. Work on that outside. What's stay with me here. I know. Stay with me. All right, the pH of water we said. The pH of water should be, right, what is the hydrogen, in, in pure water, what is the hydrogen ion concentration? We've already been through this. What is it? 1 times 10 to the minus 7. If it's 1 times 10 to the minus 7, what should the pH be of pure water? 7, and it is. That's why 7 is our midpoint on the pH scale. Okay? So that means that if we calculate anything, a pH that's less than 7, obviously, is an acidic solution. A pH above 7 is a basic solution. Okay, so now we've seen how the math goes into all of this, rather than just measuring it and saying it. Okay. So there you go. I already talked about how one pH unit is actually a factor of 10 difference, so keep that in mind. Okay, it's, a, it's a big difference from 5 to 4 and 4 to 3. All right. Whoops. All right. So we know that our scale now goes from 0 to 14. 0 means that Everything in the water had been converted to hydrogen. 14 means everything would have been a hydroxide. Okay, that they're opposite ends. They're polar ends of the spectrum. All right, so here's some common substances. One molar HCl. Remember I said like one molar solutions is about where the pH scale drops off. Now you can have above and beyond that. You can have like uh, negative values for pH. That means it's extremely acidic. But this, since we limit ourselves to water, and that's what's most prevalent, and these levels are most present prevalent in biological conditions, the pH scale is just sort of a small sample of the, of the concentration that we're dealing with. Um, so this is where it ends. The pH of zero represents a one molar acid solution. Okay? A one molar basic solution down here would be 14. That's the opposite end. And then you've got everything in between. But notice a lot of things here. that We talked about unpolluted rainwater. Even unpolluted rainwater is down to 5.6 on, on, on pH. You could calculate that. But that certainly means it's acidic, right? Why is it that even though there's no pollution present, you remind me, why is, is water always gonna, rainwater always going to be a little acidic? Because what's present in the atmosphere? CO2. CO2 can react with water vapor to form what? Acid. Good. Carbonic acid. CO2 plus H2O will give you H2CO3. Okay. All right. Human blood is always slightly basic. Um, and then uh, there's a lot of other examples here. Okay. 
what's, oh, you mean what's the pH of oranges? Okay, what oranges were. Uh, it's like, you got to be kidding me. Um, uh, it's going to be, uh, it's not going to be probably as strong as, as lemons. Lemons are some of the most acidic fruits. Um, somewhere in here, I, I would imagine. Obviously, it's going to be more acidic than an apple. So I've not tested one. I don't know. But, all right. See, you could do a whole big science fair project there. You, you could just do a bunch of pH testing with your kids, but take it a step farther and show them the math and how to calculate the actual hydrogen ion concentration. Yeah. And then you could, you could make a couple of simple steps, and as long as they understand the math, right, they can explain it. If they ever go to science fair, probably won't work. <laughs> yeah, because it'll be burned out by then. <laughs> All right. Now, let's look at, um, I want to show you another a roundabout way of doing this too, in case you're not given all the information that you need up front. Calculate the pH of a 0 .0010 molar barium hydroxide solution and determine if it's acidic, basic, or neutral. Now, uh, you can guess as to whether or not it's basic or acidic based upon the compound. Okay, but prove it. Show me the numbers. All right, here's what we know, right? We've been through this before. We know that there's going to be two hydroxides given off when this dis uh, dissolves. All right, so that means my actual concentration of hydroxide ions is not going to be this, but instead it's going to be this. Okay? All right. Now, how do I calculate pH? Can I use... Okay... That's right, but I have to have H, right? I have to have the hydrogen ion concentration. Can I figure out the hydrogen ion concentration if I know the hydroxide ion concentration? Sure I can. I use, I use KW. That's right. That's exactly what this problem is. Here, I want to know the pH of this solution. I'm not asking for the pOH, which, which exists, but I want to know the pH. That means H. I've got to know hydrogen concentration. I can figure it out if I know the hydroxide ion concentration. So I set it up accordingly. I know that Kw divided by my basic concentration is going to give me the concentration of the acid. So there it is. Now all I do is, like you say, pH is equal to the negative log of whatever that number is. 2. Why is the 2 here? There's two hydroxides that fall off from this, right? So I have one of these guys present, but when it separates, I've actually got two hydroxides free floating around. So I've got to double that concentration, okay? All right, so when I plug in the numbers and take a negative log of 5 times 10 to the minus 12, I get pH of 11.3. Now, on the pH scale, we know that that's basic, right? So this is a proof, therefore, um, to say that you're going to make the claim just based upon the formula. Okay, okay. so <clears throat> some more practice. Can't get enough of it. Calculate the pH of the following strong acid or base solution. Now, notice uh, I'm going to throw this in. For the sake of mentioning, I say strong acid and base. Because what I'm going to have you calculate in this class only deals with strong acids and bases that dissociate completely. You get into Chem 2, we talk about some, some chemical equilibrium situations. Whenever all of the H and all of the hydroxide doesn't fall apart, and you, that's a lot harder to measure the pH because you don't know what hydrogens are free floating, what ones are locked up. That gets a lot, more, that gets a lot trickier. So right now we're going to stick with strong acids and bases that you know that if there's hydrogens there, they've all fallen apart. And they're all floating around so you can measure them. All right, so we got 0 0.020 molar HCl. Going with this right here, walk me through. What would I do to calculate the pH of that solution? What formula would I use? pH is equal to what? There you go. Negative log of the hydrogen ion concentration. Because I have the hydrogen ion concentration, right? Right here. Okay, before we go, go show that, let's look at this. Can I calculate the pH given this information? Yes. yes, I can. I have to find hydrogen though, right? Okay. Can I find the hydrogen concentration from this information? Yes, I can. I can do it. How can I do it? Because I know what is true. I know that Kw is always equal to 1 times 10 to the minus 14. So that means whatever concentration of hydroxide I have what times whatever the hydrogen would be has to equal 1 times 10 to the minus 14, right? All right, so what is my concentration of hydroxide in this case? Is it 0 .005? No, it's not. Why? 
because there's two hydroxides that fall off. So what do I got to do to this? I got to double it. So what happens when I double that? 0 0.01, or, and then whatever's after it. So 0 0.01 molar hydroxide is what I would use. And when I divide that, I would get an answer for my uh, hydrogen ion concentration. Then I could use negative log of that. Okay, down here, 0.25 molar. I don't need to do all of this. I've already got my hydrogen ion down here, and there's only one, right? So 0.25, negative log of 0.25 will give me the answer that I'm looking for. So if we set it up, negative log of this number right here is 2.7, okay? That's the pH of a 0 0.002 molar hydrochloric acid solution. That's about uh, a little bit weaker than what you would find in your stomach. This is HCl is the acid that's found in our stomachs. It helps with digestion and breaking away connective tissue, and protein degradation, and that kind of stuff. All right, <clears throat> what happens with this? Now, we said that OH then would actually be 0 0.010 instead of 0 0.005 because there's two of them here that are going to fall apart. So that means to get my hydrogen from the hydroxide, I take 1 times 10 to the minus 14 divided by this number here. And I'm going to get 1 times 10 to the minus 12. Well, I told you if it's 1, that's easy, right? Because the exponent is going to be the pH. But let's do the math instead. pH is equal to the negative log of 1 times 10 to the minus 12. Answer is 12. So pH of this is 12. Pretty, pretty basic. 0.25 molar nitric acid. That means our concentration of hydrogen is going to be 0.25. Negative log of 0.25 is going to be 0 0.60. That's a really low pH. But it's still greater than zero, so it's still on the scale. It's just really small. So it's pretty strong. Okay, questions about that? Can't figure out what? Well, that's, yeah, you got to figure that out. I can help you after class if you want, if you want me to look at it. Anybody who needs help with the calculator, either stay and ask me or ask somebody else or something. Because, like I said, you don't want that to be your problem. Make sure you understand this, and then make sure you get the calculator part working. Okay, so then going back to that first table we looked at, now we can put pH values on this scale and say that's 0, that's 1, and then correspond the pH with the exponents that you see there. Same thing is true down here. When one goes up, the other one has to go down. Okay. All right, now the other way we talked about was if I gave you the pH, what was the concentration? Realize it's all the same stuff now. It's just a different way of, of phrasing the question. What is the concentration of hydrogen ions if you know the pH is 3.7? Well, remember this, right? To undo the log, to go backwards, you're going to use this. If you were going from pH to hydrogen, you would say pH is equal to the negative log of the hydrogen ion concentration. Here we're saying the hydrogen ion concentration is going to be equal to 10 raised to the power of whatever the negative value is of the pH. Okay? In other words, it's an inverse of the log. It should be on your button on your calculator to show you that. Okay? It's the inverse of the law, 10 to whatever power. So in this case, it's 3.7 is my pH. So I'm going to take 10 and raise it to the power of negative 3.7. When I do that, I'm going to get point, oh, sorry, down here, I'll, I'll come to that in a minute. When I do that, my hydrogen ion concentration is going to be 2 times 10 to the minus 4 molar. In other words, point zero 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 two. Now what does this stuff mean right here? What this tells me is, what this is saying, is that if I look at, so I know, to check my math, know that I'm right, or I'm close, a pH of 3.7 is between 3 and 4, right? If it's between 3 and 4, that means that my answer should be between 1 times 10 to the minus 3 and 1 times 10 to the minus 4. So I can look and make sure that's the case. That's what this is saying. Here's 1 times 10 to the minus 4, here's 1 times 10 to the minus 3. It's got to be between those. Is it? And the answer is yes. Okay, that's just a, a way to double check what you're doing. That's the theory. Okay, all right. So take your pH, take it 10 raised to the minus pH, whatever that is. So 10 to the minus 3.7, you'll get 0 0.0002 molar as your answer. That's your concentration value for hydrogen. So let's look. pH is 2.7. pH 12. pH 0.60. Simple. It's a matter of using your calculator, right? Setting the, setting the problems up easy. It's, imagine a, it's a, ma a matter of typing it incorrectly. 
So to get the hydrogen ion concentration, take 10 to the minus 2.7. When you do, you'll get that. On this one, take 10 to the minus 12. You get this. That's an easy one because it was an easy number here. No decimals. On this one, 0 0.60 takes 10 to the minus 0 0.6 or 0 0.60, whatever. You get 0.25 molar. Okay? Be able to do these types of problems. Be able to hit your calculator buttons right. Guess what? The pH of something. I think, do I, I can't remember if I'm going to talk about it before I give this away. Let me see something. All right. One thing that I don't have up here is that you can calculate. Let me go back one. Let me show you this, so pay attention. See this right here? pH is equal to the negative log of the hydrogen ion concentration. If I wanted to calculate pOH, guess how I do that? Negative log of what, do you think? I take the negative log of the hydroxide ion concentration if I wanted to do pOH, right? That's, that's pretty straightforward. I can substitute OH in for H, but I have to do it on both sides, okay? So if I want to take what's called the potential hydroxide, pOH, that means I would go P, pOH is equal to negative log of the hydroxide ion concentration. Okay? Same thing on this slide down here. If I wanted to do this, if I wanted to find the concentration of hydroxide, I could take 10 raised to the power of the minus pOH. I could do that as well. So realize that these, these are interchangeable. You just can't mix OH and H together. You just got to keep them separate. Now, let me ask you this. See if you can figure this out based on this scale. If I calculate the pH of something, and I calculate its reciprocal pOH, and I add those two together, what should the total be? 14. Okay? The pOH of something and the pH of something should add up to be 14. So, another shortcut that may not be on the slide, but you might want to write down just in case it ever comes up, is the pH of something plus the pOH of something is always equal to what number? 14. So that means if you've calculated the pH and the question that I have is what is the pOH of something, guess what you do? You take 14 minus your pH and you've got your pOH. Okay? That's, a, that's easy math there. So just, just remember that. Don't forget it in case it, it needs to be used a little bit later. Okay. Huh? <laughs> there's, a point, there's a point you can get, right? Okay. Buffers. Buffers are special solutions that are designed to resist changes in pH. Um. That means if I have a solution that is a buffer solution and I add a little bit of acid to it and I measure the pH, the pH will either not change or else only change a tiny bit. Whereas if I were to take that same acid and added it to pure water instead, the pH would have plummeted. It would have went way down because it would have became more acidic. Okay? So a bu buffer solutions are very important. We have them in our body. Um, they're, we use them industrially. We use them biologically. They're, they're very important because they help us maintain homeostasis. They help us not go out of whack all the time whenever we get too much acid levels in our body or not enough and we shift the pH one way or the other. We've got to be able to maintain this nice narrow window of around 7.35, no more than 0.1 either side in the human body. Okay? So we use buffers extensively in our body. Buffers are solutions that resist changes in pH when a small amount of acid or base is added. Now realize they only work up to a certain point can't dump in a big jug of hydrochloric acid and expect that buffer to handle it. It's going to become saturated to the point where it can't bond with anything else, and then whatever's left over is going to be your, determine your pH. Okay, so um, only, only a little bit. And that's what we come in contact with with our body, only a little bit at a time, unless you chug a big thing of Drano or something. Um, <clears throat> so what they will do is there are ions present inside a buffer solution that for example, if you add hydrogen, it'll latch onto that hydrogen and keep it from floating around, so it won't affect the pH. Or if you add hydroxide ions, there's ions in there that'll grab onto that hydroxide and latch onto it and keep it from floating around, so that it doesn't affect the pH. Okay. 
So they're going to neutralize whatever it is you pour in there. And that's, that's the way that a buffer is going to work. Now, how do you make a buffer? I want you to know these words. Okay, we've, we've seen them before, but I want you to remember these together in this capacity. Buffers are made by mixing together two things. A weak acid and its conjugate base. Now, see if you can think about why. You don't want a strong acid to be your buffer, right? Because a strong acid means it's going to stay dissolved and it's going to release its hydrogen and it's never going to come back together. Likewise, you don't want a strong base. A strong base will do the same thing. It will set in that solution, separate out into its ions, and stay that way. Now, you could use a weak base and its conjugate acid as well. But more commonly, you get this combination. A weak acid and its conjugate base. A weak acid is something like uh, acetic acid, something that doesn't dissociate completely. But yet, you still have, let's see if I can get a picture. Hold on, come back, there we go. Um, <clears throat> what you can have is a situation where, let's take this, this is acetic acid, okay? Notice that some of these, because it's a weak acid, some of these acid molecules stay intact. The hydrogen and the acetate ions stay together. However, some of them, um, by bringing in a weak base especially, okay, the, the conjugate base, well, let's look at this, acetic acid. What is the conjugate base of acetic acid? That means what is left whenever the hydrogen ion leaves, right? And that, that could, in theory, accept hydrogen again, even though it probably doesn't uh, most of the time. Acetate ions, okay? Hydrogen and acetate ions together make acetic acid. The, the conjugate base of acetic acid is actually this, okay? It's the ba it, this is acetic acid minus its hydrogen. In other words, you could put the hydrogen back on here if you wanted to. And that means it could theoretically accept that hydrogen. If so, then it, it's a base if it can accept hydrogen. So we've got a weak acid and its conjugate base. But here's what you want to do. What you want to do is to make sure if you have a weak acid, you're going to have more of this than you are of this right here. Okay? In the case of a weak acid, it's going to stay together a lot better than what it's going to fall apart. What you want to create is a situation where <clears throat> you've got some of it together and you've got some of it apart. But you want to be able to control that. And since you've got more of it together than what you do apart, what you're going to do is pour in something else that will bring in with it this conjugate base. Okay? For example, sodium acetate. It's a salt. If you take sodium acetate and pour it in here with acetic acid, what's important that you have, you've got sodium ions floating around, but who cares? They don't do anything. We know sodium stays dissolved. Okay? What's important here is that you have these floating around that are stuck together. Some of those have fallen apart, but not very many of them. Okay? You've got a lot of these, and now you've put in a lot of these. Now, how does this work? What will happen if I add hydrogen? Guess what can happen if hydrogen ions come in? It'll connect to these guys, right? In so doing, it soaks up hydrogen out of the solution, locks it up anyway, so that it's not affecting the pH. Because pH is only going to be affected by the free hydrogens that are floating around. Okay? If I add a hydroxide ion to this solution, guess what can happen? That's right. It'll pull off this hydrogen and form what? Water. And leave behind this ion. So what we see in both of those cases is, is little or no change in the pH. Right? Because we're controlling the, we're buffering the amount of free hydrogens and hydroxides that are being able to spread out in this solution. Now obviously there comes a point when you put enough hydrogens in or enough hydroxides in, these guys are all full, they can't work anymore, you're going to exceed that what's called the buffering capacity of that solution. All right, now to go back then, the weak acid can neutralize any base that you bring in, and the conjugate base that's present can neutralize any acid that you bring in. That's why you need those two things together. You don't want a strong acid or a strong base because they're not going to neutralize, you know, they're not going to work properly because they're going to stay dissociated. You want something that doesn't stay dissociated that you can form things with. Okay, so little or no change in the pH. So if you take acetic acid and sodium acetate, which was that picture we just looked at, you can make a buffer solution with a pH of 4.75. That means it uh, hovers around. 
it, uh, the solution itself maintains pH right around 4.75, if that's what you wanted to do. You can mix equal volumes of one molar acetic acid and one molar sodium acetate. There's the acid, the weak acid. Here's the salt that will contain the conjugate base. Put those together, you can create a buffer system. Okay? If you add 10 milliliters, just to show you how good this works, if you add 10 mils of 0.1 molar hydrochloric acid, so you add acid to one liter of your buffer and you measure the pH, it will give you a solution with a pH of 4.75. Okay? Now, if you add 10 milliliters of 0.1 molar hydrochloric acid to one liter of distilled water that had no buffer in it, look at where the pH goes to. It will give you a solution with a pH of 3. So it's a way for us to control and narrow the window of the range of where, where pH can fluctuate. That's why buffers are so important. Okay? The same truth here. Um, buffer it'll hold, if you put some sodium hydroxide, the buffer will hold around 4.75. But if you put it in, if you put that same amount into water, it will shoot all the way up to 11 as opposed to stay at 4.75. So you can see the importance in this. Um, okay. Make sure you can understand this picture here. All right, we've got enough time to finish, it looks like. <clears throat> just cruising out here. No math, no hard stuff, just some environmental issues. We talked about acid rain. We talked about what it was. Okay, I want to talk a little bit more about it. But I say natural rain has a pH of about 5.6. Um, and I told you why. and You answered to me as to why. Anything that drops below this level, though, is technically called and labeled as acid rain. Now, what would produce conditions whereby acid rain would, would happen? And it has to do with uh, a lot of industrialization more than anything else. But certainly there are a, a lot of damage that can happen to ecosystems and to structures. Um, I put a structure at the very last page of the, of the notes there. It's a picture of, uh, I think, a Washington statue um, that has experienced within, a, within several decades erosion due to acid rain. Um, a lot of these structures, now realize this, okay, a lot of these structures that are out there, like statues and, uh, made of limestone and marble and that kind of stuff, are made largely of, well, lime or limestone, in which the chemical formula is going to be what? you remember? Limestone? It's calcium carbonate. What do you think happens whenever any sort of acid, doesn't matter what it is, let's say HCl, when HCl reacts with calcium carbonate, what's the chemical reaction that you get? Okay, calcium chloride. Okay, carbonic acid. But then carbonic acid falls apart into what? H2O plus CO2, right? All right, if you take solid calcium carbonate, what do you know about calcium chloride? What state do you think that's in? Is it a solid? If, if, you, if, you, if I gave you a piece of limestone and I had you drop it in hydrochloric acid and you saw it fizzle and bub, bubble like this, this is all gas. You've got some water left behind. This is actually an aqueous solution. So guess what acid rain is doing to, to statues? It's, it's taking away some of this solid structure and turning it into solution and making it disappear. Okay? Um, it's not just on statues like that. Um, statues, uh, 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 artifacts of history, all this kind of stuff. But also, it's not just about that. It's about biological systems. Because whenever you start altering the amount of hydrogen ions that are flowing through an ecological system, like through a freshwater stream or a water table or anything like that, we operate within a certain parameter of pH. So does everything else that's alive. And we start screwing with that, we're going to damage systems. We're going we're gonna to change the way... They make their proteins. They're going to change the way they behave. We're ultimately going to affect maybe even food pyramids, reproductive strategies and patterns of these animals, which, trace it down the line, affects us. Okay? Um, so that's the implications of this. It's not to be taken lightly. Uh, the, more, <clears throat> the more we crank out stuff that can contribute to the formation of acid rain, the more we're going to be setting in it later on, literally, okay? um, of, of some of the stuff that's going to hit us. Uh, it's not that far away. This is not necessarily something that's going to affect generations later, which it certainly will. This is stuff, global warming acid rain, this is stuff that could certainly affect us within our generation. We're already seeing the effects of some of this stuff. Um, and only now, after the stuff has been surfaced, after the data's been there for a long time, only now are people starting to listen and, and, and 
if, if it moves as fast as it has so far, which is sarcastically speaking, um, it, then by the time any action is done, it's probably going to be too late. Okay, um, but let's let's just hope and let's see. Um, so, what causes acid rain? Here's the big ones: lots of carbon dioxide. Guess where all the carbon dioxide comes from? All the a lot of it's from automobiles, but just fossil fuel consumption in general. Whether it's coal burning, uh, whether it's fuel emissions, you name it. Whether it's people talking too much, it doesn't matter. Carbon dioxide is coming out. The, we're we're increasing our population. Do you have any idea? If you've never researched this, you need to. You need to take a look at some of the statistics on world population, at some of the countries that are that are are uh, reproducing like like crazy. Look at our population growth rate. Look at the population of some of these other countries, especially India. India is, is approaching the most populous country in the world. It's going to pass China. It's almost like six billion people. Um, the and that was like used to be the population of like the world at, at some point. Um, we're the this is crazy. It's absolutely crazy. We're, we, medical technology is allowing us to live longer and longer and longer, but at the same time, there's no room and there's no resources, and we're going to start fighting for all these resources before long. And some of us, there's a lot of us that are haves and a lot of us that are have-nots. Everybody in this country, I don't care. I know we have ranking systems within our own country, and we all uh, are at, you might think that you're, you're better off or less, less off than someone else, but let's put it into perspective. We're better off than virtually everyone else in the world, okay? So we need, to, we need to appreciate that. Stop comparing ourselves just to ourselves and look at what's out there and realize that 4,500 children a day die because of, I'm getting preaching now. 4,500 4, children a day die from poor water supplies, okay? And these are things that can be remedied. This is just simple whether it's contamination, whether it's, it's, it's uh, the fact that, you know what the average person in Africa has to walk to? The six miles a day sometimes just to get water, to get through the day. I mean, that, and, and what do we walk to? I walk right outside, there's a sink out here, you know? I mean, we are so spoiled, and that's okay as long as you appreciate what you have, you know? There's nothing wrong with having the things. No one's, don't let anybody tell you that. That's not it. It's a matter of appreciating what you have and realizing what other people don't have. Uh, and, and, and being able to sort of, you know, help the best that we can. Um, it's, it's, it's sad. Uh, it's, anyways, I, I can't keep going. But sulfur dioxides come from a lot of coal emission. Um, i got to get my hanky out. Stop. Put it away. Uh, uh -huh. um, so SO2. Can I get an amen from the back room? <laughs> Uh, I need an organ over here going. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> um, the, uh, the energy saver light bulbs. You know, I I I don't know the number. I just had a, I had a discussion about this with one of my students not too long ago. Um, it's not. There's a lot of things you got to consider um, with energy saving light bulbs. The light bulb necessarily itself, when we burn light bulbs, we waste a lot of heat energy. So we don't get, it's about efficiency. The more heat you waste, the less energy is being channeled into using it for what you're using it for, like to illuminate something. So that's why fluorescent lights are a better alternative because they require far less, you, you waste far less heat. So you get more energy usage to produce light as opposed to waste it in the environment. But where energy saver like appliances and things like that come in, yes, like with your appliances, you're going to use le less electricity. You're going to use less water, like for the washing machines. Light bulbs is going to be less heat, less, less wattage, things like that. Um, but the key is you personally buying that light bulb for 99 cents versus 369 or whatever, you might th not think that that's going to make much of a difference. But the big difference lies in the fact, going back to the power plants that made all of the energy that, that fuels it, um, if, if we did these things, what we would drastically reduce is the amount of these emissions that go up. In our house, we may not make a bunch of these emissions, but that electricity that you tap into comes from somewhere. And where it comes from is a lot of plants that are producing a ton of this stuff. So the more energy we waste, the more they have to keep cranking this out to, to feed demand. Okay? Um, if, we, if we use less energy, then there's less of a demand to produce this energy, and as a result, all of these emissions get cut. Um, there's, there's tax breaks out there for getting, you know, if you're building a new house, like energy saver kind of stuff. Um, it's not as good as it should be. 
Um, and the problem is, like, why don't everybody just use solar power and all that? Well, because the initial startup is pretty heavy. It's, it still takes a lot of money to set this stuff up. Um, if they ever meet that common ground to where it's just as economically efficient to set that up, then you'll see everybody moves that way. But the problem is now it's not, it's not just something easy. And recycling. I know it sounds tree-hugging for me to sit up here and, and talk about that, but think about it. You know, I challenge you. I, and, and when you start recycling, you will see that you know, if, you, if you have a family and, and, and you've got you know, three, four, five people living in your house, uh, even if you've got only a couple or even if it's only you, I think you'll see a difference. But especially if you've got kids and that kind of stuff, um, you know, you, you'll go from, say you have three or four trash containers, three or four trash bags every week or whatever. I don't know what you have. Just say, you, I, I almost guarantee you that if you recycle, you're going to cut that down by two-thirds. You're going to get down to like one-third, okay, one, like one bag a week. And then you're going to take, think about junk mail and all that stuff. You know, how much, how much energy is wasted and how much recycling can happen with junk mail. I know like at our house, we've got uh, one container for papers. We've got uh, aluminum cans, steel cans, and plastic bottles. Okay, even if you just want to separate it to that minimum, um, you're going to reduce the amount of trash that you put in the landfill, uh, and you're going to just reuse all this material. And it's not about, you're, you're thinking, okay, so what? I throw a pop bottle in the trash, I throw a pop bottle in the recycling bin, who gives a crap? I'm not going to save the world with my 20-ounce bottle of pop. Um, <coughs> well, maybe not. But <coughs> the point is, the more we are able to put that we know from chemistry that all this energy is recycled. We know that energy is conserved. I mean, things don't just disappear. They, they are put back somewhere. And if we can take all this material that can be reused and reuse it, okay, I think you'll be surprised at how much of an impact you can make once you start doing this. If you put it back in, then there's less of a need for all these plants and manufacturers to keep putting more of this out. Okay? And we can't afford to keep putting more of this out. We just can't do it. Okay? But we'll learn. Uh, let me finish up real quick. I just got a couple slides. Um, the, here's the equations that are going to uh, contribute to this acid rain. Okay? I told you about man-made is the big one. Um, natural, we've got back, a lot of bacteria can contribute to this, but so can volcanic eruptions and all that kind of stuff. Um, <coughs> weather patterns are going to come into effect. I told you before, what we're doing here, um, I used to have an ecology professor that used to say, uh, they made, he went to school at Purdue, and they used to make fun of people down in Terre Haute because they always say, flush your, make sure you flush your toilet because Terre Haute needs the water. Um, the, <coughs> the, uh, what we do does not just affect our area, okay? It, it trickles down and affects other places. Um, it, look at this. Uh, here's our map, okay? Here's, notice our, our rain levels are almost 10 times past what normal rain levels would be in terms of concentration. Say about 4.6 around this, or, or down around, uh, somewhere close to us, closer here, 4.7, we'll say. That's almost 10 times more than normal acid concentration. We're in an industrial area, especially up around here. You're going to find that this is a pretty heavily industrialized area. And what's going to happen, and what you're going to see, though, is wind patterns and wind currents that sort of spiral this around, take it out this way. These people out here just get this way mostly because of what's happening, especially in this, this area right here. But this will travel across the ocean. It'll travel all the way to Europe. Um, we can affect the entire world with the consequences of the actions that we take. Okay? So flip through those. Those are just blown up shots. Um, real quick, go through here. I told this already. Uh, talked about that. And there. Okay. So that was about 1935 is, is, was this picture when this was taken. So within, what is that, 70 years or so? Look at the difference. Okay? Well, this was even less than that. That was only 60 years. Look how much of a difference that makes. 